Hey everybody, welcome back. We have a response here from Jordan Peterson on Theo Vaughn's podcast talking about alcohol. Dr. Peterson says some very important things in this clip, but he also says some things that are almost true, but not exactly true. And I think this is something that we really miss with psychology now. This is something I talked about this past week on the, the podcast in response to Johan Hari talking about depression and anxiety. He's right, but he's not exactly right. It's only part of the picture. And that's what Jordan Peterson does here. He only communicates part of the picture of why we use drugs and alcohol. And we got to be really clear about what's going on. So I'm going to take every opportunity I can to be as clear as possible. Clear as possible about issues that even really smart people like Dr. Peterson get incorrect. And then we're going to tie his response here to the recent news that he has uh, checked himself into rehab for clonopin addiction, which is an anti-anxiety medication. So some of what he's saying now, looking back, seems a little bit prescient. So let's see what he has to say. I'm in a 12 step program in an AA, right? So I was an out, you know, um, I'm in recovery. So almost two years now. And that really changed my life getting into, you know, 12 steps. And, you know, well, uh, you know, and I know that's your book. Um, but I, one of the things that stuck with me is esteemable people do esteemable things. Mm-hmm. And it's like, right. And it's like when you have that choice to do something it's better than right. alcohol, man. Yeah. Yeah. And the funny thing is, if you're trying to stop drinking, you need something better than alcohol. Mm-hmm. And alcohol is pretty good. Yeah. So you better find something a lot <laughs> better, man. Yeah. And and it is. And then esteemable people do esteemable things. It's like, yeah, well, you want to figure out you want to figure out something that you're doing with your life that's worth not getting drunk and screwing up. Yeah. Right. Esteemable people do esteemable things. But what happens when you find yourself unable to do what you want to do? I mean, esteemable people do esteemable things. That is a tautology. It doesn't mean anything. By the way, tautologies are fine when you're dealing with axioms of a field. A is a law of identity. That's a a tautology, but that's an axiomatic concept in the field of of philosophy. Excuse me. Of course, esteemable people do esteemable things. And if you're able to make the choice to do something esteemable, then please do it. But the realm of psychology is figuring out why you don't do what you want to do. You know what esteemable is. Yet you still find yourself not doing it. Yet you still find yourself lost in, on video games and, and internet porn. And I know Dr. Peterson isn't saying this exactly. But when he's unclear about this. When he just tells you esteemable people do esteemable things, what that implies. Now, I know he's not saying this, but this heavily implies if you don't do esteemable things, then you are not esteemable. This is the problem with this woo-woo self-help sounding esteemable people do esteemable things that don't mean anything because it doesn't help. We all want to do esteemable things, yet we find ourselves unable to do it. And if you're listening to this thinking, no, I always do exactly what I want to do, if I think that something is esteemable, I do it automatically. You are in denial. It's okay. You mess up. You avoid. You kowtow. You, you know, you, you muffle your words. You don't say exactly what you think you should say. The issue is why. And the reason that I know Dr. Peterson doesn't go into any of this, even though I haven't read in, in everything that he said The reason I know he doesn't go into any of this is he doesn't know how emotions work. And unless you understand how emotions work exactly, not sort of, but exactly, then you're not going to understand why when you want to do something esteemable and you know consciously it's esteemable, yet you don't do it, you understand why you don't do it. And it has nothing to do with you and who you are just comes to an issue of understanding and working with your emotions in a proper way. Continuing. Yeah, you want to have something on the other side of that teeter-totter that has uh, some value to you. You bet. You bet. And so that you can think, no, no, I'm not going to get drunk and screw that up. Right. Because, you know, you might say, well, why do people drink too much? It's like, if you like alcohol, that's a stupid question. Yeah. (laughs) Right. It's like, why do people drink too much? Well, because it's great. You know, it's like, okay, so why stop? Well, you do stupid things when you're drunk. You hurt yourself. You, you compromise your health. It's really hard on the people around you. You tend to turn into a liar and it screws up your life. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah, well, it is. But you need something better than that. And what's better isn't B12 
being straight and 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 not making mistakes. It's like that's all prohibition in some sense. What's mm-hmm. better is no, you need an adventure, man. You need Again, this is true, but it's only part of the truth and I would say maybe 5 or 10% of the truth. Yes, if you do have a problem with alcohol or opioids or clonopin, it is, of course, worth having something getting up for that isn't the drug or alcohol. But that's not going to take care of it alone. You need to manage your emotional issues that are so terrible, you need to escape them through drugs and alcohol. Dr. Peterson often says throughout this video how fun drugs and alcohol are, and yeah, it's fun to go to a bar. There's an adventure to it. No, not really. You're doing that as an act of avoidance. And we know this because when people cure their addiction and they go back and use again, it sucks. They go, why was this fun? This doesn't feel good. Drugs are never designed to feel good. The drugs that your body gives you endogenously were never designed to make you feel good. Simply not bad. Simply to take the fun away. The avoidance of pain may feel like the pursuit of pleasure. It may feel that way. But again, we're being exact. We need to understand exactly what you're doing. More importantly, why you're doing it. Continuing. To get out there and have something to do. Yeah. And and something worth waking up for. And you need, that's the substitute for the addiction. Actually, the addiction is the substitute for that, if if truth be known. Right. But, but eventually you can flip that around and you can find the, you know, the uh, the much girthier and, and more, uh, there's a lot of sexy weight in having self-worth, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I've started to slowly mm-hmm. find in my life. Yeah, and you might also, like, the thing, too, is, you know, I mean, there's something kind of, I don't know, the the bar scene, the, the, the heavy drinking scene, there's something kind of edgy about it, you know, and something kind of adventurous mm-hmm. about it. And, you know, you see that, it's kind of dramatized in people like Tom Waits, who's got that real hard edge, or Johnny mm-hmm. Cash, or people, hard-living guys, you oh, know. Oh, yeah, guys with six really... or seven livers in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> Yeah, well, there's something kind of romantic about that. Yes. And and fair enough, you know, but, well, then what that means is you have to build something like that into your own life. Mm. So maybe you need to go, maybe you need to, you know, take an adventurous trip now and then. You've got to have something there that, that that's that's edgy to replace that. And Yeah, he talks about replacing your, your drug or alcohol addiction with something that's edgy. Okay, but then you're just replacing it. You're not getting to the root of why you are using the drugs and alcohol in the first place, which is to avoid pain. If you just replace the drugs and alcohol with something edgy, you're still doing something just to distract you from from the issue. If you put down the drugs and alcohol and then turn to adrenaline junkie, you're still a junkie. You want to cure yourself of addiction, manage the pain that was causing you to escape the pain through the, the drugs and alcohol. But in order to do that, you need to know how to manage anxiety. And that's what we do here. Continuing. You're afraid you're going to die or you're afraid you're going to become addicted. So, so let's say what, what of life, what would have life like been like you for, for you if you were addicted? So you don't have a career anymore. No. Right. So you've given all that up and failed. So that's fun. So that's going to drive you even more <laughs> yeah. t- towards drugs. Yeah. It would have been all my dreams. It would have been miserable. Right. It would right. have been so, hell. Exactly. Is that, so why quit drinking? So I don't end up in hell. Mm-hmm. Hey, there's a reason There's a reason to stop. And then if you make that hell real, it's mm-hmm. like, here's all the details of my personal hell. Yes, let's avoid that. Right. So then you have something to run the hell away from. Right, so now you to have something towards. towards and something to run away from. And oh, can you imagine just creating a list of things that, that to run towards and a list of things you're running away from? That can work. But not for drugs and alcohol, and it's been proven not to. This motivational interviewing kind of, of treatment for drugs and alcohol is ineffective, woefully ineffective, even when compared with something that is traditionally seen as ineffective, like 12-step programs. This kind of message seems nice, but ultimately it is crippling. In the long term, this is crippling. I understand it feels good to watch Jordan Peterson and listen to him and say, hey, you're tougher than you think you are. Because your dad never told you that, and that's too bad. But you don't need anybody telling you that who you're tougher than you think you are, or you're weaker than you think you are, or anything else. But you don't need anybody telling you that you're tougher than you think you are. You need somebody to tell you how it works, how you work, how you can sit down and write things out so you're not dealing with drug or alcohol addiction. You're dealing with being unable to ask out this girl in math class. So you sit down and list out all the good things that would come about if you asked her out and it worked out well and it went well, then all the negative things that could happen, you list it all out and you see, okay, this is what I'm running towards, this is what I'm running away from. And then next day, third period, 
something comes over you. You freeze up. You don't know what exactly it is. That is the pain. That is the anxiety. And unless you take the extra step or the extra two steps of first explicating it, understanding it, and then managing it, it's it's going to keep getting worse and worse. And Jordan Peterson here is going nowhere near this issue, this crucial issue. Even though everything that he's saying isn't technically wrong. Continuing. This is one of the hallmarks of a friend. Here's two hallmarks. Mm -hmm. A friend is someone you can tell bad news to. And they won't tell you why you're an idiot. And they won't interfere with your suffering. They'll just, they'll, just, they'll just listen and maybe they'll suffer along with you. Mm. Okay, so you can tell bad news to them. And they won't tell you some worst thing that happened to them. They'll listen mm. and they'll suffer along with you. But a friend is also someone you can tell good news to. And the friend will say, wow, in this veil of tears, something good happened to you. Great, man. Congrats. I'm wonderful. It's rare. It's unlikely. Good for you. I hope 10 more things like that happen. And they're not envious and they're not jealous and they're not one and up in you. This veil of tears, I think he's implying here that life is a veil of tears. I mean, here's just more of that, that Christian metaphysics, like life is suffering. And the only release from this suffering that is this low base material world is dying and ascending to a higher realm. It just like, just little seeds like that also mess up your psychology. I mean, this is kind of off the point here, but watch out for that. People tell you life is suffering, desire is suffering, everything's a struggle. No, dude, a struggle compared to what? Don't do that. Veil of tears. Jesus. Continuing. Why is it hard for people to let go of what's so familiar with to them, even if it's bad? Well, because it's complicated. You know, and the thing, that's a really good question. You discount the risk of familiarity that you're familiar mm. with. So, like, let's say... Because people are in relationships. People are in relationships with the drugs and alcohol. People yeah. are in relationships with humans. People are in relationships with jobs. People are in relationships yeah. with their own selves. And they live, they're live. they living a lie every single day, but it's, yeah. it's familiarity. Yeah, well, you say, I have a job I hate. It's like, well, yeah, but I'm not dying from it. It's like not as bad as it can be. So you, you kind of, you kind of, you factored in the risks already. They get invisible. You think, well, I can't jump out of this job because what about all the risk? It's like, yeah, no kidding. You got to make a, you got to get your resume in order. You got to send it out. You got to send 50 of the damn things out before anybody will call you back. Then you have to go get interviewed and maybe you're not any good at that. You have to come up with a story while well, you're a good employee and maybe, and maybe you're not yet. So you have to figure out how to do that. It's like, what about all these risks if I go look for a new job? It's like, yeah, absolutely, man. Those are risks and they're harsh and no wonder you're avoiding them. What about the risks for you to stay with this job you absolutely hate? Mm. Yeah, again, another indication here that he doesn't understand psychology. When somebody talks about all the risks of getting a new job and, oh, what if I have to give up this drugs and alcohol and then come up with a list of, quote, risks of, of giving up drugs and alcohol, that's not real. That's the anxiety talking. That is a symptom of the deeper cause, which is the anxiety. That is a, a manifestation of, of an obsessive thought of the avoided anxiety. Look, another indication that this guy, this psychologist, as intelligent as he may be, I suppose, he doesn't un understand emotions. And it's very difficult to take control of your life until you understand emotions and how they work. And look, I don't want to rag on the guy because he seems to be in a low place right now. But he is now in a rehab facility, clonopin addiction, because he has this anxiety that he never speaks to. I'm not saying he deserves it. I'm just saying it's clear there was a blind spot here, and it's not just Jordan Peterson. I'm not ragging on this guy. I'm using him as a representation of a zeitgeist in a psychology establishment that kind of deals with emotions, but ultimately not really. But until you can understand this stuff, it is going to take control of your life, and you will find yourself Nikki Sixing a bottle of pills. That's when you just chug pills <laughs> like it's a beer. Just Nikki Sixing a bottle of pills. And you don't even know why you're doing it. Esteemable people do esteemable things. Well, why am I chugging this bottle of clonopin? Because there is something there that you're not speaking to. You would call it irrational, but it's not irrational. It just has a rationality of its own. It has a structure. It is a four-dimensional thing. And we are living in this three-dimensional plane. We need to understand it as that. And I'm not saying like I'm some great guy who, you know, who could never be in rehab. I, no, I totally could. And that's the idea. 
that's the idea of understanding emotions. I could, of course, be in rehab at some point, even though I never have been. Wouldn't be for clonopan or op opioids or anything. It'll, it'll be for alcohol, I'll tell you. If you find out that I'm in rehab, you don't even have to ask what it's for. It's going to be for alcohol. So I'm not saying I'm like better or anything than, than Jordan Peterson or, oh, he only found himself in rehab because he don't, doesn't understand emotions. No, I understand emotions way more. I can still end up in, in rehab. It's not a conscious, rational, oh, uh, l l list out things that you, that you want to more of in your life and list out things that you don't want any of in your life and go towards the things that you want and go away from the things you don't want. It's deeper than that. It's more complicated than that. We're dealing with an issue that has been here for hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years before you were born and our descendants will be dealing with it for another million years until we're another species. This spiritual issue of modern man and I will call it an emotional issue to be exact because of that, we need to understand how emotions work. That's what we do here. AnimusEmpire.com. We have therapy. We have group therapy. But even though, you know, I haven't been through this addiction thing necessarily, I, you know, I have been through tons of things in my life where I found myself wanting to do what an esteemable person would do, but I couldn't do it. That's in essence the shamanic initiation. And you break apart. You want to do what you want to do, but you can't do it. And you break apart. Your identity breaks apart. You look at the pieces and you put them back together. And then in putting those pieces back together, you help put other people back together. And if there's a silver lining here, maybe that's what Jordan Peterson will learn when he's in rehab. I mean, you know, they're not going to teach him, but he's going to have to use his own mind to figure out what exactly is going on. He'll put his own pieces back together. He'll learn about emotions. He'll begin to get in more insights in how they work. And maybe he'll emerge from this experience, perhaps as a good psychologist.